Hello and welcome to our webinar today. Thank you all so much for joining us. Before we get started with the presentation, I just want to let you know about some other upcoming events and webinars that we have. Um, on Tuesday, June 8th, we've partnered with Dara Sleep, PhD, MPH, and the University of Utah Rocky Mountain Center for Occupational and Environmental Health to offer a free webinar on chemical exposures and reproductive health of nail technicians. And on Wednesday, June 16th, we've partnered with Dan Meenan and Linda Emanuel, RN, and the Midwest Center for Occupational Health and Safety for a free webinar on discovering the root of your backstory, understanding and preventing back injuries. And our next COEH webinar will be on Wednesday, August 4th. We'll be taking the month of July off, so a little break there. <laughs> Um, but on Wednesday, August 4th, we've partnered with Stephanie Holm, MD, MPH, and the University of California, San Francisco to offer a free webinar on wildfire smoke. You can learn more about these events at CUEH at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our webinar for today. On behalf of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, I would like to welcome you to Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder in Intensive Care Unit Nursing, Findings of a Concept Analysis, and that is presented by Paula Levi, BSN, and RN. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. A few housekeeping announcements for our participants here. Um, you're going to be muted during this presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A box. And we'll be saving plenty of time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as we can. So please do feel free to utilize that Q&A box for your questions. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page. And all participants who log in with their registration email today for the full live presentation will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording and an evaluation form that will qualify you for a certificate of completion. Once the evaluation is completed, you'll be able to access and print that certificate. And at this time, we're pleased to welcome our presenter for today. Paula Levi, BSN, RN, is a second year PhD student at the University of Alabama at Bur Birmingham School of Nursing. She is a National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health Fellow. Her research focus is on intensive care unit nurses with post-traumatic stress disorder and interventions to allow these nurses to continue working in their stressful workplace. Thank you so much for being here and for your research and for sharing it with us. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining in today. I'd like to thank the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of California, Berkeley for inviting me to speak with you today. As you heard, I'm a doctoral student at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Nursing and a NIOSH fellow. I'd also like to acknowledge my NIOSH funding, which has supported my doctoral education and research for which I'm extremely grateful. As of, two, as of September 2019, my research focus has been post-traumatic stress disorder in intensive care unit nurses. This concept analysis was performed in spring 2020, just as the World Health Organization announced the coronavirus, COVID-19, as a global pandemic. At this time, I'd like to recognize the other authors of this concept analysis. Dr. Patricia Patrician, Dr. O.J. Montgomery, Dr. David Vance, and Dr. Jacqueline Moss. Post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD is a psychiatric disorder affecting nearly 5 million adults in the United States, costing more than $42 billion annually. Due to the nature of the job, namely caring for complex, high acuity of patients, ICU nurses may be affected by numerous stressors and trauma, traumas in the workplace. These can include performing cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR, frequently witnessing death and serious injuries of patients, caring for patients who are suffering, violent acts from patients or family members, and performing fetal care. Consequently, ICU nurses are at high risk for developing PTSD. Well before COVID-19, Miller et al. determined that about 33% of ICU nurses had symptoms of PTSD and approximately 20% met the American Psychiatric Association diagnostic criteria for PTSD. The incidence of PTSD in ICU nurses will likely be unprecedented from caring for COVID-19 patients. 
I'd like to talk a little bit about the background of the history of post-traumatic stress as a disorder. Widespread attention was brought to the concept of psychological trauma after thousands of young soldiers experienced horrors during combat in World War I. The term shell shock was created to describe their condition with symptoms such as uncontrolled crying, feelings of numbness, inability to speak, and memory problems. During the 1960s and 70s, physicians and researchers caring for trauma victims, such as Holocaust survivors, rape victims, and abused children, accumulated more understanding of this unique type of psychological trauma and made significant scientific contributions. In 1980, with this new knowledge and the extraordinary number of Vietnam veterans affected with chronic psychological distress, the American Psychiatric Association first included post-traumatic stress as a disorder to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM-3. Since then, with each revision of the DSM, the criteria for PTSD have changed considerably. In 1994, the DSM-4 revised the de definition of PTSD to include both direct and indirect traumatic events. Since then, PTSD has been recognized in healthcare professions, especially in nursing, that are continuously subjected to witnessing death and dying. The DSM-5 revision involved approximately seven years of planning and six years of actual work to get approval of the APA Assembly and Board of Trustees. There was much debate among trauma experts concerning the revised proposed criteria as the revisions were substantial. In 2013, the DSM-5 revision changed PTSD from an anxiety-related disorder to a trauma and stressor-related disorder. This diagnostic category is distinctive in that there is the requirement of exposure to a traumatic event as a precondition, which is the first condition needed to be met to qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD called Criterion A. This, this revision refined the definition of trauma as actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. The controversy arose because some studies found that with this new revision, about 60% of PTSD cases that met DSM-4 criteria were excluded from the DSM-5 because the traumatic events involved only nonviolent deaths. With this revision, repeated or extreme exposure to aversive details of a traumatic event was added, which applies to workers who encounter the consequences of traumatic events as part of their professional responsibilities, such as nurses and first responders. The revision increased the number of symptoms from three groups to four and the number of symptoms from 17 to 20. The DSM-5 symptom groups are intrusion, which is criterion B, avoidance is criterion C, Negative alterations in cognition and mood is criterion D, and alterations in arousal or reactivity is criterion E. Criterion F specifies that symptoms must last longer than one month, G, that symptoms cause significant distress and or impairment, and H specifies that symptoms are not due to medication, substance use, or other illness. A concept analysis is beneficial when a concept has changed over time because of new knowledge or when there is confusion concerning its definition. Walker and Avant's concept analysis method was chosen for its structured and rigorous process. By using Walker and Avant's eight-step framework, the concept was broken down into its components and differentiated from similar concepts. The iterative process helped refine the concept by identifying all uses of the concept and defining its key attributes antecedents and consequences. The eight steps are select a concept, determine the aims or purpose of the concept analysis, identify all uses of the concept, determine the defining attributes, construct a model case to better illustrate the concept, construct a borderline case, and construct a contrary case to clarify what the concept does not entail. Identify antecedents which must result before the concept and consequences which occur as a result of the concept. And the final step is determining the empirical reference which assists in measuring the concept. There is little found in the literature as to how PTSD applies to IC nurses and how they experience PTSD in the workplace. The purpose of this concept analysis was to better understand PTSD as it pertains to IC nurses. 
A review of the literature included peer-reviewed research articles published in the literature over the past 10 years from 2010 to 2020. Inclusion criteria for this concept analysis included articles in peer-reviewed journals that performed or discussed studies which evaluated PTSD and or psychological stress in ICU nurses and were written in the English language. The databases searched included CINAHL, PubMed, and PsycInfo. Search terms included post-traumatic stress disorder, psychological stress, and intensive care unit nurses. The search resulted in 53 articles found in CINAHL, 90, 97 articles in PubMed, and 142 articles in PsycInfo. The combined results of the database searches resulted in 292 articles. A total of 69 duplicates were removed. The resulting literature was examined by evaluating titles and abstracts for relevance. This preliminary title and abstract review excluded 179 articles that were not articles on PTSD and psychological stress in ICU nurses, resulting in 44 articles that were, that were reviewed. After a thorough review, 34 articles were excluded since they either were correlational studies, which only stated prevalence rates and did not describe symptoms of psychological stress or PTSD in ICU nurses, or the prime focus was on other topics such as resilience, emotional exhaustion, or which type of ICU had the highest prevalence of PTSD. So a total of 10 articles were included in this concept analysis. Of note, Few peer-reviewed manuscripts regarding COVID-19 have been published at this time. One of the 10 manuscripts selected, the article by Shen et al, investigated ICU nurses who cared for COVID-19 patients. Article findings were recorded in a table. PTSD attributes, related symptoms, consequences experienced as a result of PTSD, and how PTSD or psychological stress were measured was documented. Step three of the Walker and Avent method entails in identifying all uses of the concept. The American Psychological Association Online Dictionary of Psychology defines PTSD as a disorder that may result when an individual lives through or witnesses an event in which he, she, he or she believes that there's a threat to life or physical integrity and safety. This the disorder may also occur from repeated exposure to traumatic events. The online free medical dictionary defines PTSD as the trauma and stressor related disorder in DSM-5 arising from a traumatic event involving actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. In step four, defining attributes were determined. The defining attributes are the most important aspect of the concept analysis since they offer the broadest insight into the concept. The four defining attributes identified were re-experiencing, avoidance, negative alterations in cognition or mood, and hyperarousal. Eight of the 10 articles reviewed determined re-experiencing symptoms, such as involuntary memories, nightmares, or flashbacks of the traumatic event or events. Re-experiencing events are typical immediately following a traumatic event. However, when they last longer than a few months, it can be a predictor of PTSD. Re-experiencing can be triggered by tactile sensations, smells, noises, or unwanted thoughts. Miller et al. reported that one nurse could no longer eat salmon because the look and texture reminded her of her traumatic experience caring for her patient with an open wound. The nurse participant recalled, so you could see like the bottom of her spine and you could see like all the connective tissue. My poor husband, he made this really nice dinner with this salmon and it was just like the color of it and the texture of it and I almost got sick. I couldn't eat fish for a long time after that just because I can't look at it. Physical indicators can include muscle tension, a racing heart, profuse sweating, and reduced heart rate variability, which I will talk a little bit more about later. Five of the 10 articles reviewed determined avoidance symptoms. Avoidance is exhibited by avoiding thoughts or feelings of the traumatic event. Additional signs involve avoiding people and situations that bring on distressing memories of the traumatic event. For ICU nurses, avoidance is often demonstrated through avoidance of similar patients from the experienced trauma and absenteeism. 
In Deborah et al's study, one ICU nurse stated, certain patients were avoided. I sometimes feel the need to choose risk-free patients. Substance abuse and excessive alcohol use is another, another me mechanism of avoidance documented in ICU nurses with PTSD. In Mueller et al's study findings, PTSD nurses spoke of using alcohol to excess as an aid to sleep or as a mechanism of escape. Lastly, in dire cases of PTSD, there may even be suicidal thoughts as noted in Shen et al's study, which investigated ICU nurses who cared for COVID-19 patients. Six of the 10 articles determined symptoms of negative alterations in cognition and mood. After ICU nurses have experienced trauma in the workplace and are suffering from PTSD, they may feel changed from the person they were before and have feelings of detachment and estrangement. Also, a distorted sense of blame for the triggering event may occur. There may be a marked lack of interest in activities previously enjoyed, as well as feelings of detachment and estrangement from friends and coworkers. Some study nurses in Mueller et al study felt they no longer really knew anyone or trusted anyone and had no one with whom they could share their grief. Nine of the 10 articles illustrated symptoms of hyperarousal. Hyperarousal is a physiological response to stress that is similar to the fight or flight response. Symptoms can include hypervigilance, angry outbursts, and being easily startled. Hyperarousal symptoms can lead to problems maintaining interpersonal relationships. In step five, a model case was constructed. Pamela is a 32-year-old ICU nurse who works in an intensive care unit of a large hospital. Over the past week, she has been caring for a 71-year-old patient with COVID-19. Pamela's patient only requires supplemental oxygen in the form of a nasal cannula when first admitted, but now the patient is extremely anxious and gasping for air. The hospital has been inundated with COVID-19 patients and supplies have dwindled. Pamela increases the patient's oxygen, administers the ordered anti-anxiety medication, and puts in a stat call to the respiratory therapy team and the patient's critical care doctor. Then Pamela looks around the unit and wonders if any of the other patients on ventilators might have recovered enough to be weaned. The alarms go off in Pamela's patient's room, and she realizes that her patient is experiencing a cardiopulmonary arrest. A code blue is called, and despite her efforts, along with the code team, the patient died. Pamela becomes consumed with thinking about what else she could have done to help her patient. She awakens from nightmares of the traumatic event, often finding that her heart is racing and that she is in a cold sweat. At work, she now avoids patients that remind her of this patient and becomes anxious when she gets new patient assignments. She is also having trouble concentrating and startles easily when she hears alarms. Her friends call her to get together for a walk, but she no longer takes pleasure in activities that she once enjoyed. This case includes all the defining attributes of PTSD, re-experiencing, avoidance, negative alterations in cognition and mood, and hyperarousal. In step six, a borderline case and contrary case was constructed. In the borderline case, Kayla is a 32-year-old ICU nurse working in a surgical working in a surgical ICU at a local hospital. She receives a 30-year-old female patient post motor vehicle accident from the operating room. The patient is intubated and receiving a massive transfusion of packed red blood cells, but the patient continues to hemorrhage from the abdominal surgical site. Blood is saturating the patient's gown and sheets. Despite the massive transfusion of blood, the patient experiences a cardiopulmonary arrest and expires. In the next few months, Kayla cannot stop thinking of the patient hemorrhaging and has been having nightmares about the event. At work, Kayla becomes anxious when she is assigned patients after abdominal surgeries because they remind Kayla of losing this patient. Fortunately, she has been able to care for patients with other types of surgeries with ease. She is also able to enjoy her life outside of work. Kayla has symptoms of re-experiencing and avoidance but does not demonstrate symptoms in all the symptom clusters and therefore demonstrates a borderline case. In the contrary case, Krista is a 29-year-old ICU nurse at a trauma center who receives an 18-year-old male after he accidentally shot himself in the face when falling out of a deer hunting stand. 
Krista is horrified by the young man's wounds, but continues to work with competence to stabilize the patient. The patient experiences a cardiopulmonary arrest and expires, despite her appropriate interventions, along with other nurses on the unit and the code team. Krista is visibly shaken by the loss of her patient and cries with other staff members who attempted to save the young man. She talks to the nurse manager and team leader immediately after the event and feels better after seeking their support. After work, she meets a friend to go work out. Although Krista was subjected to a traumatic event, she experiences none of the attributes of PTSD. Step seven involved identifying antecedents and consequences of the, of the concept. Antecedents are events or incidents that must occur prior to the occurrence of the concept. The antecedent for PTSD in ICU nurses was their stressful work environment where exposure to traumatic events were experienced through direct patient care, such as performing CPR, witnessing patients die, or experiencing violent acts by patients or family members. Indirect exposures, such as repeated exposure to traumatic events in the ICU workplace also qualify as an antecedent. According to the Society of Critical Care Medicine, approximately 20% of patients admitted to the ICU die. An additional antecedent for ICU nurses was a lack of support from their manager, coworkers, and organization. A lack of support was felt by ICU nurses when they reached out to their nurse manager for help, but were criticized or reprimanded for their lack of knowledge. They felt they didn't really know their coworkers or were not being heard, or they did not feel appreciated by their organization. Consequences occurred as a result of the concept. Consequences of PTSD for the nurse included PTSD symptoms of intrusive and involuntary memories or nightmares of the traumatic event, avoidance of similar patients and situations, diminished cognitive ability and concentration, and hyperarousal symptoms. But there are also increased health risks with chronic PTSD, such as diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, anxiety, depression, substance and alcohol abuse, reduced heart rate variability, and in severe cases, suicide. The majority of the articles analyzed reported on the pre prevalence of anxiety and depression in IC nurses with PTSD. Stress disorders such as PTSD, anxiety, and depression can often overlap. The overlap of these disorders can lead to diagnostic confusion and more importantly, the underdiagnosis of PTSD. Current research suggests that ICU nurses with PTSD had a higher risk of developing burnout syndrome. With burnout syndrome, the ICU nurses suffered from an emotional exhaustion, depersonalization and feelings of failure. Heart rate variability is the change of time intervals in consecutive heartbeats. Prior research examining heart rate variability in military populations and first responders has shown that a higher heart rate variability reflects healthy self-regulation and adaptability in response to stress. Lower heart rate variability can indicate pathology, inadequate ability to adapt to stress and be a predictor of PTSD. When ICU nurses suffered from symptoms of PTSD, there were also consequences for the patient. Patient care was affected by each of the four defining attribute symptoms that IC nurses experience with PTSD experience. For example, re-experiencing symptoms led to poor sleep quality for the ICU nurse, resulting in physical exhaustion. Avoidance symptoms resulted in avoidance of similar patients or lack of quality care if they did receive a patient similar to that from the tra traumatic event. Negative alterations in mood was found to result in a lack of empathy for patients. Studies reported that ICU nurses with PTSD experienced diminished concentration and cognitive ability, which has been linked to medication errors. Lastly, some nurses with PTSD had angry outbursts towards patients and family members as a result of hyperarousal symptoms. There are also consequences for the healthcare organization, which are negatively impacted by substandard job performance and poor patient satisfaction scores, which lead to a decrease in government funding. The healthcare organization is also affected by absenteeism and retention issues. Nurses may leave their job seeking to escape the effects of their trauma. 
Significant costs are incurred to replace IC nurses who choose to leave their job and staffing issues arrive from increased workload for nurses who remain. According to the Society of Critical Care Medicine, replacing one IC nurse costs approximately $70,000. In a critical care call to action paper, Masa L. put this in perspective by saying, using this figure, a hospital with 40 ICU beds and 100 ICU nurses with the current annual turnover rate of 18% will cost the hospital nearly $1,260,000 per year to replace these nurses. Step A entailed choosing an empirical referent to measure PTSD in ICU nurses. Empirical reference are actual phenomena that demonstrate the existence of the concept and therefore are concrete representations of the concept of interest. The disorder of PTSD has been defined and classified by the DSM-5, giving rise to symptom clusters, which then form the basis for screening tools for PTSD, such as the Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Checklist, or PCL-5, which is used extensively in research as a measure of PTSD symptoms. The PCL-5 can estimate presumed prevalence of PTSD and establish a provisional diagnosis. It is one of the most used tools and has free access in the public domain. Blevins et al. determined that the PCL-5 has been shown to have strong internal consistency and test-retest reliability, and is a psychometrically sound self-report measure of the DSM-5. When ICU nurses suffered from symptoms of from Symptom, PTSD symptoms as a result of trauma in the workplace, the psychological burden was especially difficult because they spent the majority of their day in the environment where the trauma occurred. Furthermore, their job required them to work in a fast paced environment and to sometimes make quick and critical decisions based on the slightest imbalance in their patient's condition while titrating IV medications, for example. When suffering from PTSD symptoms such as impaired cognition, a high stress workload adds to further stress, especially if they have no tools or interventions to manage their symptoms. Limitations of this concept analysis include that only peer reviewed articles in the English language from online research databases were utilized, leaving the potential for missed references. Also, a paucity exists of peer-reviewed articles regarding PTSD with a strict sample of ICU nurses. A few articles included some physicians or other ICU personnel in study samples regarding PTSD prevalence in the realm of intensive care. The findings of this concept analysis contribute to important implications for occupational health nursing practice. Despite the prevalence of PTSD in ICU nurses, policies addressing screening and interventions are notably lacking in our healthcare system. Symptoms of PTSD lasting longer than one month should be addressed as soon as possible to prevent manifestation of persistent symptoms and the development of anxiety, depression, and burnout syndrome. By understanding the concept of PTSD as it relates to ICU nurses, prompt identification and diagnosis can occur and timely treatment initiated. The initial voluntary assessment of mental health at point of hire for ICU nurses and ongoing assessment checks can assist in early identification and prevention of PTSD. Additionally, the nurse will be better equipped to determine if she or he is suitable for the position and working in such a stressful environment. While PTSD has been recognized as a critical problem in ICU nurses, there are few evidence-based interventions available in practice. Heart rate variability can be a valuable non-invasive measure of psychological stress and assessment of the autonomic nervous system. If reduced heart rate variability is discerned at point of hire, nurse managers could suggest mindfulness-based cognitive therapy training to mitigate psychological stress. The use of heart rate variability assessment via a wearable device such as a wristwatch with software technology when used in conjunction with a resiliency training program can offer a much needed intervention for ICU nurses and may allow them to continue working in the stressful environment of the ICU and not leave their position or their profession. Lastly, a healthy work environment in the ICU must be achieved to reduce the risk for development of PTSD Managers can establish a healthy work environment and support for ICU nurses by recognizing commendable efforts on a job well done to make sure 
to make the nurse feel valued as an employee and allowing collaboration, ensuring their voice is heard. NIOSH introduced the Total, Work, Total Worker Health Program in 2011, recognizing that workplace interventions are needed to improve the overall health and well being of the worker. Hospital administrators, nurse managers, and occupational health nurses must work together to implement policies and interventions to reduce the risk of PTSD for their ICU nurse employees. Thank you. I've enjoyed speaking with you all today. Thank you so much for your presentation. This is such an important topic and I think even more relevant and salient um, in the world that we are currently facing. So thank you so much for sharing your research with us. Um, at, yeah, at, at this point, if you are a member of our audience and you have any questions, we definitely welcome you to enter them into the online Q&A. We have plenty of time to engage in a really rich discussion about this. So please do keep the questions coming. Um, one of our first questions that has come in, does the age or experience level, um, either in the ICU or overall time in nursing of the nurse, correlate with the risk of a PTSD diagnosis? Yes, uh, usually it's younger nurses with uh, less experience um, have a higher chance, a higher risk of developing PTSD. Thank you. And, and on that thread too, I'm curious if you can speak a little bit to the structure of ICUs, for example, the risk of PTSD in ICU nurses in trauma hospitals, or if there's other hospital ICU units that maybe don't engage with the, the physical trauma so much, and if there's any correlation between PTSD risk in those situations as well. Well, I definitely think that there is, and I think that ICU nurses are at higher risk just because like I said, about 20% of patients die. And it doesn't necessarily mean that because a patient dies that that's going to be traumatic. But uh, there are times when um, uh, unexpected events happen or you've, you know, you've developed a relationship with your patient and your, the family of the patient and you know, they become more ill and you, you, you know, you've developed, like I said, a relationship and uh, it can be more traumatic for you or just uh, something unexpected happens, or that you just, you want to save them, but you can't, you know, there's all kinds of reasons for uh, a nurse experiencing trauma. But yes, I, I see you're more likely, I believe, and probably the, the more, um, like if it's a level one trauma unit, you know, you're more likely to experience more trauma, I would say. Absolutely, thank you. And um, we've also had some questions kind of related to, to the military and nursing. Um, I actually, that statistic you shared with the rate of PTSD being similar before COVID-19 um, among soldiers and nurses really, really struck me. Um, and someone asked if, with, if there's any increased risk specifically for nurses who are also in the military and mentioned that the VA is reluctant to allow PTSD in the military healthcare personnel. Um, I'm sorry, could you say the question one more time, please? Yeah, absolutely. Is there any increased risk um, in nurses in the military, or is that any data that you've been able to, to notice or see? I, I have not come across any um, articles that discuss this, but I also have not searched for um, this type of information, but it has been brought up to me um, maybe in the last 30 days. Uh, some other questions about uh, making comparisons with the military. So it is an avenue that I would like to pursue uh, learning more about. Thank you. Yeah, and on that thread too, someone also added um, Army ICU nurses and also prison nurses and seeing how that might compare to private sector ICU nurses. Uh, I know for myself, if, if I was in a prison ICU, I, I would feel I would feel <laughs> pretty, you know, uh, I could possibly have some situations where I might be traumatized. I have no experience with that, but I can imagine that that is um, that can be a very stressful condition. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Well, and, and on that, um, you mentioned especially to acts of violence, experiencing violent acts by patients or family members. And I know violence, workplace violence, specifically in healthcare, um, and special, specific, even more specifically towards nurses, is increasingly a topic that we all need to be focusing our attention on. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, it, on that, is there any other, I guess, stories or evidence or things that you've encountered on the impact of workplace violence on and ICU nurses and how that might contribute to PTSD? Oh, it's one of the uh, number one uh, reasons that ICU nurses do experience PTSD. I'm sorry, I don't have a statistic with me today, um, but it is one of the number one reasons and it's um, becoming, it's seen more and more often. And, um, I, you know, there are many people working on policies to help prevent this. Um, so it's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know um, we've in the past, we've hosted a course on um, workplace violence prevention and healthcare, and just hearing stories of people being spit at and bit and in other uh, levels of physical violence. And, and I can only imagine the level of stress that places on a person. I'm trying to show up and do their job um, and go home afterwards and how much yeah. you, you carry that experience with you. Yeah. Um, another question, have you heard any uh, reports of issues with ulcers or other chronic illnesses as a result of PTSD? Uh, before chronic issues, what, what did you say? Um, ulcers. Ulcers? Yep, ulcers. Ulcers are other chronic issues. Um, well, chronic issues, uh, I might say could qualify under the, like I said, the diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Uh, it could even uh, mean anxiety and depression that is seen with uh, PTSD. So it uh, doesn't mean that you will develop these. You're just, you're just um, more at risk if you have PTSD to develop these other chronic issues. Thank you. Um, and I know you mentioned that a lot of your, I guess the scope of your analysis was English speaking papers, but also curious, have you been able to identify or look at any of the data, of the risk of PTSD for nurses in other parts of the world? Have you seen any studies around that? Yes, and, and some of my studies uh, were from other parts of the world. Um, for instance, the one uh, from China with Shen et al. But uh, this was a, uh, an article that was written in the Engli English language. So um, there, you know, like I said, there were some others from other countries. But as long as they were written in English, they could have been from other countries. But yes, I've, um, I have been examining um, PTSD that um, was incurred from caring for COVID-19 patients. And so I did take a, a very good look at um, the literature that's been going on, you know, all over the world with ICU nurses caring for COVID-19 patients. And have you noticed any similarities or differences in comparison to US-based nurses? Um, I don't think so. I think PTSD, uh, it can happen to, to anyone, honestly. And I, I really have not noticed that uh, one population is more resilient than another. Even for instance, with um, uh, those nurses in China or Italy, um, England, and of course the United States, they, they were all hit very hard by COVID. Um, but I have not noticed that one population was more resilient. And I guess this this also kind of ties into the um, evidence based interventions. You know, uh, other all around the world, there are different medical styles in terms of how we approach our healthcare system. But PTSD is an omnipresent um, influence in everywhere that you go. Yeah. Wow. Um, another question. Um, thank you. This is incredibly powerful research. Is NIOSH funding burnout research? for other healthcare professions as well that you're aware of. Absolutely. Great, thank you. And as a shout out to NIOSH, um, there are 18 different education and research centers around the country um, that help fund research in different academic units. 
Um, and there's also the total worker health centers and the agricultural health centers. So there's definitely a rich, rich library of resources for people to dig in if, if you're interested in these topics. Um, did you, uh, we also have um, an occupational medicine physician um, who's on the call who was in the US Army and has experience with the VA system. Um, and they wanted to let you know they'd be happy to discuss their experiences with you anytime. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I, I should have uh, put my contact information on the, um, on the PowerPoint here, but yeah. pleby at uab.edu. Great, thank you. And also from the audience, if you if you want a connection, feel free to shoot shoot us an email, reply to the CUHCE, and we can also connect you that way. Um, a follow up question: Did you observe any gender differences in healthcare professionals and PTSD rates? I did. I didn't uh, see in the literature that women are more likely to um, to sustain or to acquire not acquire to be affected by PTSD. Uh, women are, are more likely than men. Thank you. And, and I'm also curious about the, the cultural awareness or acceptance of PTSD as an issue in, in ICU care, um, in nursing, and, and any, um, I guess this would probably be more anecdotal, but, but any thoughts you might have in the culture around being willing to engage with PTSD is there, you know, any concerns about being judged or excluded from the workplace? If you, you know, acknowledge experiencing symptoms, kind of what is the culture around this as an issue in that workplace? Um, I actually did a um, study last summer with uh, ICU nurses who were caring for COVID-19 patients. And um, the majority of them uh, could be given a provisional diagnosis for PTSD. They, uh, as nurses know um, the signs and symptoms of PTSD, but it, it actually took them a while to, to realize that this was what they were experiencing. They were you know, full of anger and uncharacter uncharacteristically yelling at people that they love and just realizing, you know, wait, what is going on here? Um, they had many other symptoms as well, but I, I don't think that they, uh, we're thinking of any kind of stigma, um, but even though our country has been trying to overcome the stigma of mental health issues, it does still exist, unfortunately, but uh, these nurses did not speak of that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, the other part of your presentation that, that really struck me too is just how, acknowledging the impact on the way that you might engage with your life outside of work, you know, the way that you engage with the world. Um, so as you mentioned, you know, getting angry as you when you're leaving work and lashing out in other places, not trusting anymore. Um, yeah, it, I, it's interesting to think about in terms of our, you know, my own, some of my own friends that work in ICU or trauma care. Um, and just how, how you can notice impacts like that, the way that you see your community, the way that you see the world around you, um, and, and what that might have to do with, with PTSD. Yes, your worldview changes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, what is the reason behind changing DSM-5 and excluding so many cases of PTSD? Um, off memory, I'm sorry, I'm not looking at this uh, directly, but the way that the DSM-4 was worded, I believe that when 9-11 um, happened, our, mostly most of our entire country could would have qualified uh, for PTSD. I believe that was their reasoning and changing the wording, uh, that it had to be more than witnessing uh, a traumatic event. So, and I, I believe that's how it was in the, you know, in the DSM-4. There was a lot of controversy and, and you know, many people are, are still not happy with the DSM-5 revision. Wow, yeah, it's, well, and I guess too, with the, with the way that our world has shifted, you know, the, the amount of trauma that all of us are exposed to on a, an unfortunately consistent basis, that's an interesting rationale for changing, changing the DSM. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we, you also mentioned during your presentation that there are a few evidence-based interventions available in practice, um, which I think is another really important point. 
And we have an audience member that had some questions about what, what are some possible treatment options, um, if there are any effective therapies for both PTSD and complex PTSD. They mentioned that they've heard of tapping, EMDR, and other newer drug-related options, but they're still too new to provide data. And they have heard also that there are a few effective therapies, um, and there might not be as much money in developing effective therapies. So they're curious for any input that you might have in that space. There, there definitely are uh, uh, therapies for those with PTSD. Uh, I would like to see uh, something happen before PTSD develops, or it may be, you know, you've just experienced a trauma. I would like to, to use heart rate variability uh, via a watch that you could wear and learn how to see if you have high or low heart rate variability, if you're experiencing stress. And then um, having some tools such as learning a cognitive based um, therapy and um, breathing techniques to try to, you know, bring your heart rate vari variability back up and, um, you know, something like that. I so appreciate that. Yes, prevention, right? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. <laughs> and it's something that they could just see themselves. Um, I think People want to know what's going on with their body and you know these uh, watches that people wear they give them instant feedback on what's going on with their health so i think they would like uh, nurses would like something like that where they could see I'm, I'm feeling stressed and i need to do something about it and on that thread have there been um, any any studies or any impact or things that you could trace to to people implementing that type of program is this a, a new idea that you're considering doing research on i guess where, where does this come from yes it's it's so, something that i would like to do research on awesome wonderful uh yes and someone said also sometimes using for example a rubber band on their wrist <laughs> and some other intervention strategies that way um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about um, some of the impacts you mentioned on the workplace in general, um, the impact of PTSD in terms of burnout, um, and also avoidance, avoidance of similar patients that might have a similar trauma or absenteeism. Um, is, are there any, I guess, uh, not to pull data out of, out of your brain, but um, any rates around absenteeism or other impacts like that that you're able to speak to more? I'm sorry, I don't have uh, rates off the top of my head about absenteeism and how much there is. Um, but I do think that interventions to help nurses um, st can still work in their environment and, and not experience the symptoms of PTSD, I think that will go a long way toward uh, reducing the absenteeism and retention issues. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and in your opinion, what other research is needed? And, you know, what don't we know that we, we would be really benefited by moving forward? Um, there's so much research that needs to be done. Um, mostly, one of the number one problems uh, that I see is that there's very few studies that are, that are only on ICU nurses. Uh, there's always other um, populations in, in the healthcare system that are always together, or mostly together uh, with ICU nurses. So I'd like to see more strictly on ICU nurses, and I'd like to see interventions um, tried and see if it's something that they think that could go in the mainstream that could be used. Sometimes there are studies with interventions, but then nothing ever happens after that. So I'd like to see something that um, nurses feel they would that they would like to use. And have you observed any institutional support for that kind of research or implementing those kinds of interventions? I understand that the, the world of medicine is a bit uh, overtaxed at the moment, but I'm just curious what level of support you've experienced in bringing and engaging in some of these ideas. Oh, absolutely. I, I think um, UAB is, is very much in support of an intervention for nurses. And I'm actually going to be able to do a study this fall. And based on the findings of this study that I'm going to do, I hope to um, develop an inter intervention. And I know UAB would like to support that. 
That is wonderful. Well, we would definitely love to hear about the results of your intervention study as well. <laughs> I'm sure everyone on this call too. Thank you guys all so much for, for being here with us today. Um, we do have time if anyone has another question. Um, now is your moment. Otherwise, we're going to start wrapping up the webinar. But I do want to just give one more minute here in case anyone has a last minute question they'd like to throw in the mix. Okay. Well, and um, do you have any, I guess, last minute thoughts or advice or maybe if there, if there is a, a nurse that might be experiencing PTSD or symptoms of PTSD, is there any parting wisdom that you would like to share with our audience today? Well, um, I would hope that uh, the nurse would talk with their um, manager and um, see what resources they have available to them. Great. Thank you so much again for presenting and engaging in this really super important and vital research. Really, really appreciate you being here today. Um, and thank you to everyone also for joining us for today's webinar. Um, and being with us on the call and for your wonderful questions and engagement. As, as a logistical reminder, an email will be sent out tomorrow afternoon with a, the webinar recording and a link to the evaluation for everyone who logged in with that registration email today. And be sure to check out our website for more information and to register for up, other upcoming events. That's cueh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. And thank you again so much for all the wonderful questions and a special thank you to you, Paula, for your, your sharing your, your knowledge and wisdom with us today. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.